Well, hello and welcome to the e-commerce podcast with me, your host, Matt Edmondson. This is a show all about helping you deliver e-commerce wow. And to help us do just that today, I'm chatting with Stephen Schneider from Trio SEO about why, you know, you should still have a blog on your e-commerce site and how to get content right on your product pages. We're getting into all of that kind of stuff. Oh, yes, so you wanna grab your notebooks, you're gonna wanna grab your pens. I think you're gonna be taking a lot of notes from this episode. But of course, if you're listening to this in the car, you know, or you're walking the dog around the park and you don't have said notebook and pen, We've got you covered. Just head over to ecommercepodcast.net. All of the notes, the links, the transcript, everything will be there. And of course, if you sign up to the newsletter, then it'll all come to your inbox automatically. You don't even have to go to the website. It just it just ends up in your inbox, which is a beautiful thing. Uh, so make sure you go ahead and do that. And of course, if you're new to the show this week, if this is your first episode of the e-commerce podcast that you've listened to, well, it's great to have you with us. My name's Matt, and I just love doing the whole podcast thing. It's just it's such great fun. We get to chat to amazing people like Stephen. We're going to have a great conversation. So hopefully you enjoy it uh, and subscribe to the show. Join in the community and all that sort of good stuff. But a very warm welcome to you. Now, let's chat about Stephen, the maestro of Trio SEO, where he transform, transforms, no, he transforms even, blogs into lead generating machines. Previously ruling over a domain of 40 blogs and churning out 400 articles a month to hit seven figure Nirvana. <laughs> I love that. He now joins forces with Connor Nathan, who has been on the show, actually. Uh, we'll get into that. Uh, and the trio SEO talents to make content your business's best friend. Oh, yes. Together, they are turning the digital world into a customer catching carnival. <laughs> That's a good alliteration. Uh, Stephen, welcome to the show, man. Great to have you on. How are we doing? Thanks, man. That's quite the intro. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to, to carry just no carry my life in buckets and just, you know, follow me around wherever I go. That was, that was the best way to start my morning. If I can get that just as a uh, automatic, you know, alarm clock, that's, that's magnificent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just, just take the clip. Just turn it into an alarm clock. Yeah, and why not? And why not? Uh, it's funny how you said this is great for you to start the morning uh, and I'm ending my day. Such is the beauty of time zones uh, and worldwide conversation. Um, but we were talking before we went on air. You're from... Well, you're based, I don't know if you're from Seattle, but you're in Seattle, right? Yeah, yeah, just about an hour north, born and raised, been here all my life. Fantastic, fantastic, which means you're on the other side of the world. Now, if you're regulars to the show will know that last year I took a trip to the US uh, and I took a slight detour. I went over to Subsummit, um, which I'm going to again this year, by the way. If you're going to be at Subsummit, anybody listening, come say how's it. It'd be great to see you. But um, yeah, I was... <laughs> I took a sort of slight detour. I went to Oregon, uh, to Astoria, mm -hmm. Oregon. So the furthest I've ever been west in the United States. Uh, the home of the Goonies, um, uh, mm -hmm. which is just, you know, what it is famous. The only, it's, 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 it's a beautiful part of the world. Claim to fame is the Goonies movie um, and Short Circuit, the film there. I think there's a few others that I can't remember the names of. Oh, uh, I think Arnold Schwarzenegger shot a movie there. But it is a beautiful, beautiful part of the world. I can see why you would want to live on that side of the, uh, of the Americas. Yeah, no, it's a nice little oasis. We only get, you know, two months of sunshine a year, but take what we can. Well, it's welcome to England. Uh, we don't even get two months. I'm True. not even sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hard to complain when you're preaching the choir, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it's just one of those, right? Oh, well, yeah, that was a little bit sunny. I'm looking out the window now. Don't know where it's gone now. Behind a cloud somewhere. Uh, so Trio SEO, working with Nathan, what's that like? It's been great. Yeah, we, we kind of met out of a, you know, really random spur of events, just connected through LinkedIn. Um, small talk led to another as I kind of connected with uh, Connor Gillivan, who's been a longtime SEO. Um, and yeah, we just started, you know, kind of talking about each other's backgrounds. Obviously, I, I you know, was aware of their free up success, uh, my background in blogging, which we can kind of dive into and all that sort of stuff just kind of came serendipitously to the perfect match. And um, started discussing, you know, what would it be like to create mm. a blog writing agency, kind of given all of our expertise and just the kind of, you know, demand out there and kind of this unmet match between people in the e-commerce space, people in other spaces looking for SEO, but also not really knowing how to, you know, 
tread into SEO because it is kind of this abyss of unknown territory for people who think it's black magic. Other people think it's (laughs) out of reach and they think it's just never going to happen for them. So we're, we're trying to take a really, you know, simple approach to delivering results and just kind of keeping that our, our core offer. And it's been working really well. Fantastic. Now, Nathan Hersher, dear listeners, you may or may not remember if you're a long time listener, I say long time listener, he was on a couple of months ago, uh, Nathan. And I'd not spoken to Nathan before. I think we'd connected either on Facebook or Instagram or something before he came on the show. And so, as I always do before we get to record an episode, I do a little bit of stalking on our guest to find out some information, you know. Uh, and I saw that he was friends with Jared Mitchell, who has also been on the e-commerce podcast and someone who I've become great friends with. Uh, and so when Nathan came on, I'm like, right, we're just going to we're going to get Jared on as well. So uh, it was the three of us just chatting. I totally sprung that on everybody, um, which was quite nice. good fun. I've, the only time I've ever had a co-host on on the e-commerce podcast, so I remember that. And Nathan was a good sport. So, uh, yeah, it was it was good fun. So let's get into it then. Uh, you mentioned you've got a blog writing agency. Um, can I start off then with a slightly contentious question? Uh, cause I, I know the answer, but surely blogs are dead, aren't they? <laughs> well, we would be out of business if that was the case. So <laughs> thankfully it's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, blogging is far from dead. I think, um, everyone is up in arms with just how SEO is changing nowadays. Yeah. You know, with the most recent core algorithm update in March, uh, which was really targeting, you know, spammy AI content. And I think, you know, without a doubt, we're going to see changes in the foreseeable future when yeah. it comes to SEO and how content is created and published and ranked. But blogs aren't going anywhere. Yeah. It's interesting you mention um, the, I mean, we'll get into blogs and obviously how we do blogs and how, you you know, your, your, your tools and recommendations for that. But uh, I, was, I was smiling because at 2, th- it's, what time is it now? It's 4 p.m. So an hour and a half ago, I got an email from Neil Patel. It wasn't a direct email. I'm on Neil's um, email list. But apparently Neil and Jared Mitchell, who I sprung on Nathan, quite good mates. Uh, so maybe we'll get Neil on the show, but he sent an email going through saying Google's March, 2024 core updates was a wake up call for many in SEO outdated practices and shortcuts don't work anymore. Join our webinar to find out why. Um, and I thought this is an interesting statement. So what happened in March, 2024, you mentioned about how Google are now looking for spammy AI articles or they're penalizing you for that, but was that it or it was there more to it? That was pretty much the gist of it. I mean, there's always going to be some minor, you know, tweaks under the hood when it comes to whatever they're changing. But, you know, there was a couple of big pillars um, of what they were trying to shake out. And AI content was definitely at the forefront of those pillars. Um, I think that it's been a long time coming. You know, early on, Google said that they even had difficulty in trying to decipher AI versus non-AI and human written Mm. content. And even if you look at a lot of the you know, tools available where you can go and I can personally upload an article that I handwritten myself Mm. and it might come back as 99% AI. And so, you know, these tools nowadays are just not sophisticated enough to decipher good from bad. And so a lot of people are saying, well, do you think Google can really decipher good as bad as well? And so up until this point, it had kind of been this gray area of, well, if you post AI content, be ready for any of the repercussions that might come down the road. And in March, 2024, those repercussions finally came to life. And so mm. um, Google took their best stab at trying to pinpoint sites that, you know, were kind of teetering that line or just flat out abusing it and publishing, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of pieces of content and was pretty unrealistic in terms of how content should be produced and just the mm. guidelines around it. And they were trying to abuse the system, of course. Um, however, double-edged sword of that is that sites that are playing by the rules are not creating AI content yeah. and are actually top tier sites also somewhat got penalized. So of course, it's never going to be a perfect foot, like curve, you know, however you look at it. But at the end of the day, um, I think that what it shows is that, you know, you can't really just, abuse AI and expect that content to rank. It's going to be looked at differently as it should. You know, people shouldn't be yeah. able to post yeah. an article from ChatGPT about 
how to cure cancer and expect that to rank. You know, mm -hmm. there still have to be guidelines given the niche, given the industry and how people are receiving that content. Because if you rank on Google, there's a lot of trust that comes from being that top result. So if mm -hmm. you read that content, you have to assume that there's some legitimacy behind it. So, um, yeah, it, it was kind of an interesting world in the SEO kind of landscape for the last month. Well, I, I want to get into that. But before I do, I, I, let me jump forward slightly and then we'll come back if that's all right, because uh, we're talking about this topic of AI. And I know, myself included, I have used AI tools to help me generate copy. Um, whether that's, you know, with the podcast, like generating show notes, help me generate show notes, you know, or whether it's things like, um, I don't know, just a bit of copy for the website. And I'm sure I'm not the only person that's done that. So are we safe? Um, because I've not done a thousand articles. I've just, you know, done a bit of AI here and there. Or should I be in a cold sweat night right now rewriting everything that, uh, that I've done? Yeah. So, I mean, I would say everything in moderation, you know, if you're, if you're changing the primary CTA on your hero section of your homepage, you're not, you're not going to be slapped on the wrist for that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're doing a 200 blog article update and it's equivalent to maybe a hundred thousand words of content, you should expect some sort of backlash from that yeah. in the event of something happening. So, you know, I think that to the degree to which you are choosing to engage is going to dictate the end result. And yeah. I would say at the other side of that, your ability to take the original piece of content from AI and edit, improve, match it to your brand tone, match it to your formalities and take it from a, say, maybe a six out of 10 and then modify it into a 10 out of 10, which I would hope you do to put it on your site and have mm -hmm. some, you know, all the other things and guidelines attached to it, that's not going to be an original piece of content, quote unquote, at the end of the day. So yeah. if you're strictly just taking it from ChatGPT, pasting it onto your site and letting that stand, um, I would say, you know, take it with a grain of salt, that bulk. Yeah, no, fair play, fair play. Well, let's get into it then. I mean, I, uh, let's go back to the beginning. I mean, you, you said that blogging is not dead. Um, so if I am an e-commerce on well i am an e-commerce entrepreneur I, we do have a blog so i've I'm, I'm i'm okay i feel like i'm in safe territory uh Stephen, if i'm honest with you uh, but if i wasn't uh if i didn't have a blog on my established e-com site or if i was starting up a new e-commerce site why should i think about blogs why should i i i have one yeah so it's one of my favorite questions and i think the reason being is that websites and seo like i said it's, it's kind of this unknown like what is it how does it work and so the best kind of description i like to tell people is that if you want your content or your site to rank organically meaning there's no paid ads on top of it and you're mm -hmm. just kind of popping up in the results you have to give google or any other search engine a reason to recognize and understand what your website is about so yeah. you have say 10 product pages an about page a contact page and a home page well, that's pretty much the cap right there. So Google or the search engine can only understand what you have to offer customers based on that content. And so right. if you have a blog and you have all of these different articles and they're clustered together in terms of the topics and how they're over interwoven and maybe one builds off of another, well, if you picture an iceberg, well, you have all of this content below the water, so to speak, of your website. Mm -hmm. And that's what kind of builds out your topical authority and just helps Google and other people recognize, hey, you are an expert, you are credible, you do have this trust and all of the kind of EAT acronyms, which is your experience, expertise, authoritativeness, and the trust built into your site that proves, hey, this brand knows what they're talking about. And we yeah. can actually send people to their site with some sort of trust behind that. So super. So the reason then for me having a blog is is really to help Google rank my website to to let Google know what's going going on. How how should I approach my blog then from I say a customer's point of view? Yeah, great question. So a true SEO, we take a what we call is kind of like a bofu bottom of funnel approach to all of our content, and we start to prioritize your content based on however we can get people who are closest bottom of the funnel engagement to your site. So 
if it's an e-commerce product, you know, we might talk about like how to guides, or maybe it's a versus guide or, you know, um, a versus B, or it could be, you know, all these different things that might help people make that decision or that, you know, click in their head that says, oh, I'm ready to buy. Yeah. Um, obviously, if you kind of move away from that funnel, there's going to be different levels or different types of content that kind of work people in. But overall, it adds this cohesive strategy that allows Google and everyone else to understand that, hey, maybe I need a couple extra minutes to decide and I'm going to go read this article and bounce back to the product. And within that entire experience, you know, the readers are still met with CTAs or maybe an exit intent pop up. So they're still kind of still, you know, in touch with the brand and kind of mm -hmm. all that process. But at the end of the day, we kind of like to think about blogs and specifically the keywords that we merge within blogs as doors to your website. So even though an article might go after a primary keyword, you know, within the outline of the body of that article or that blog, you know, we might add in 15, 20 secondary keywords. And those are then entry points for people to find your website based off mm. FAQs or, you know, an H2 heading that could be like, um, what is a blank, et cetera. So we're trying to always pinpoint what people are going to be searching for and then how we can bake that into the blog experience and just drive traffic to the site. Stephen, there's a lot there. Jeez. Uh, so <laughs> uh, we'll get into that. So just explain uh, some terminology for me, if you can. So Bofu, bottom of funnel. What do you mean when you say bottom of funnel? Yeah, so bottom of funnel, there's, that's going to be kind of the, the closest people who are ready to buy. So if we look at like top of funnel, these are more of the people who are just doing research, you know, like, you know, anything of how much does a, you know, XYZ cost? Like they might be closer, but they're not ready. They're just yeah. getting their feelers out there. Middle of funnel is going to be people who are kind of in between. So they are closer along. Maybe they're looking for something else to kind of make that decision for them. And then that's that kind of end result. And then bottom of funnel is like, you know, if you're looking for like something, a product brand name specific with a serial number, like chances are you're looking to buy that on the yeah. go. Or yeah. like if you're an e-commerce website, like best articles, like best you know, hiking jacket or best, et cetera. Like they're looking for the best product and they're ready with their credit card. So in an e-commerce landscape, if you were to curate a roundup of the top 10 best ski jackets and you were to rank for that organically against REI, whoever's out there, good luck. Um, <laughs> chances are you're going to be getting a lot of traffic and a lot of sales because mm -hmm. people are looking for that product. They're already envisioned. They've already gone through all the work and they're just saying, give me the best product and here I am. So bottom of funnel means bottom of funnel. If you think about conversion tactics, yeah. like they're ready to convert, they're ready to go. So this is interesting because, uh, years ago when, you know, when blogs were not when blogs started out, I mean, blogs started out in some respects before e-commerce did, but it, it a while ago when we started doing the blogs in e-commerce, we were always sort of told top of funnel, right? Go, mm -hmm. go and create articles for people, top of funnel, get them onto your website, get their email address, nurture them through your email sequences, and then hopefully you'll buy. What you said uh, is slightly different to that tactic uh, in the sense of you're writing articles to people who are bottom of funnel, they are ready to buy, uh, which sounds to me like a very deliberate choice. Um, or are you doing, um, I assume you're doing both is reality is what, ha what is happening, Stephen. But um, um, I've not really heard that distinction in terms of blog writing before. So has that been successful for you guys? And I guess, how did you stumble across this concept? Yeah, so two questions are, I'll kind of start with the, the latter. So um, my background is in kind of the large scale blogging aspect. So this is kind of like back when SEO was the Wild West and you can get away with a lot more. So you know, back in the day, we had like 40 different blogs, each in hyper focused niches. And we went after all of those bottom funnel keywords because they were affiliate style articles. So yeah, like best X, Y, Z, we post about that. So having that bottom of funnel kind of idea wasn't really new news when we talked about Trio SEO. Yeah, because at the end of the day, the other side of that conversation with anybody who's looking at SEO is there's this kind of double-edged sword dilemma where people want to invest in SEO. They want to have all the benefits of it, but they also don't want to wait a year for it. And SEO is such a game of delayed gratification that when you look at how do you balance those two worlds, you have to say, well, anybody who's in business, regardless of what you're doing is ROI focused. Agreed. So at the end of the day, you can't be spending 
six to 12 months of someone's time and resource is going after the wrong content. So mm -hmm. what we do is we go after high intent keywords that are closely related to ideal customers for that brand. And then outside of that, kind of do a reverse funnel approach. So we'll go bottom, middle, top, because at the end of the day, if SEO is not working and driving results, what's the point? Obviously you might get backlinks, you might get other leads, but everyone who's engaging in SEO wants the cream of the top organic traffic that leads to more sales. And so by going from bottom first, that's exactly what you get. And then all of the other kind of topics between middle and top are more of what we call like solidifying topics. And they kind mm -hmm. of bake in the, um, the well-roundedness of your site and just kind of help strengthen the inner pieces of it. Super powerful. So if I, I mean, I'm, I'm just looking over here on my shelf because I've actually, I, I, cheap plug, I suppose. We have a brand uh, which does uh, Omega-3, right? It's a vegan certified Omega-3. I could wax lyrical about the amazingness of this product, Stephen, but I won't because this is not what this product, uh, this podcast is about. But let's say I'm uh, launching, you know, I've got my website, I sell my Omega-3, I don't really have a blog. Should I then start with something like, you know, the best Omega-3s for vegan and vegetarians that, that are out there today? And then I would write a blog post that would obviously contain my Omega-3 as well as say the Omega-3 from various different competitors. Is that what the, the sort of the best of articles are, are actually about? Yeah, so in that case, yeah, it's, it's kind of also a toss up because nobody who wants to mention their competitors on their mm. site and say, hey, here's how you direct traffic. So what we can do in that case is, you know, you'd want to shine light on your product, put that first and say, this is why it's the best. And then you can always include that and say, you know, here's are some alternative options and here's kind of where we stand competitiveness and why this is, you know, superior. Um, but on top of that, if you just strictly post that one article and expect that to rank, you just, it's not going to have the same likeliness of success because an SEO, the content strategy, you need all of the other pieces of the puzzle in order to kind mm -hmm. of bring it to life. And so strictly having that one article doesn't really show Google that you have the credibility to speak on that subject, especially if you're a new website and you have no domain rating, you don't have any backlinks, you don't have anything that points to your site saying, send people to this website. We trust that what you're offering people is factual, realistic, and comes with authenticity. And so sure, it'd be great to start with that article, but at the end of the day, you definitely want to add other content. Maybe it's mm. What are the benefits of omega threes? What are omega threes? Are there other types of them? What are the downsides? What are the pros and cons? Like all of these other pieces of content that when you're reading that guide, you can internally link to other pieces mm -hmm. and show people, hey, if you're unfamiliar with omega threes in general, read our ultimate guide on what they are and the benefits of taking supplements like this. So just like with anything, you'd hope that there is a kind of ultimate sphere of content or a library of content that you can refer to if you're a very basic reader yeah. and you need to learn everything under the sun. Well, that's kind of how Google looks at it is that if you're trying to be this top tier brand, you hopefully should know everything about it as well. And yeah. so that's kind of the logic behind why more content is always better, but how you produce that content and how it's connected to each other is kind of the, the core strategy of what kind of brings it all to life. So this is, uh, this is an important thing, actually, because we often say, I get asked a lot, Stephen, you know, if I, I'm going to start an e-commerce business, what product should I sell online? And, and one of my responses is to show them what I call the product knowledge matrix, uh, sorry, the knowledge demand matrix. So uh, this matrix is, you know, how in demand is the product? Um, and the other axis is, well, how much do you know about the product? And if you don't know an awful lot, how much can you know about it? Can you learn about this product quite quickly? Um, because you know, you're gonna to wanna to be seen as an expert in this whole thing. And so presenting that knowledge then to the world, not just to Google, but to your customers, is, it becomes important. So, I mean, you mentioned then the structure is becomes then the strategy of it. So what sort of thing should I be thinking about um, from a structural point of view? I mean, you've just given me 20 titles of a blog post that I could write about Amiga Threat. To be fair, we've got them all written, so uh, thankfully. Um, but. Um, I mean, I say that, I'm just, I, I don't actually know. I'm going to ask Jen, uh, who will know. But um, 
what sort of things should I be thinking about then from a structural point of view? You've mentioned things like backlinks, you've mentioned things like internal links, high intent keywords, all these kind of things. Um, where do I start with that? Because it, it can be a bit bamboozling, which is a great word, actually. Bamboozling. <laughs> I'm going to start using that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot. There's a lot to unpack when it comes to SEO. And that's kind of why, you know, at least at Trio SEO, we take a really simple approach. We say, hey, we'll focus on the content. We'll create the strategy for you. We'll do the outlines. We'll write it. We'll publish it. We, up, we upload it as well and make sure that it's a very hands off approach. Uh, alternatively, if you have a team of writers, you can also look at just doing strategy and outlines through us. Yeah. And then we'll kind of pass that over to you. But like you were saying, when it comes to backlinks, you know, everyone I think has heard of backlinks, but at the end of the day, it's all about just maintaining partnerships and creating, you know, relationships with people who can offer that trust or that vote of confidence over to your site and link from theirs to yours. So we always suggest that backlinks are kind of like a passive out of sight, out of mind thing that you should be doing regardless. It's very similar to investing in your retirement starting from age 20. If you're yeah. a brand new site, you know, you're not going to touch that money for 40 years, 45 years, but you're going to be think thankful that you did it at the end of the road. Yeah, and yeah. so same thing with backlinks. Um, but when it comes to content, I mean, the strategy is so difficult to grasp at some degree, because if you don't have the right tools to do the competitor research or perform the gap analysis on your top competitors, you're kind of just, you know, throwing darts against the wall in the dark yeah. and that's scary because there's time and resources that go into all of this. And so um, at the end of the day, if you're coming in this with zero SEO knowledge and you just know that you need content, FAQs are a great place to start. What are your right. customers asking you about? How can you help them by creating that content on their site? And then maybe if one really is popular, expand on that, take that into an ultimate guide and look at what competitors are doing. You can Google any keyword and probably get an article on it and then take a look at their the structure of it, what are the headings reading as, and you know, what are the you know subheadings, all that sort of stuff is kind of the outline structure and the psychology that goes into a well-rounded article. So mm. there's a lot to unpack, as you said, but I think at the same time, it depends on just taking it slow and kind of coming in with a different set of eyes and looking at it through a different lens. And then as you're reviewing your competitors, you start to see all of these random keywords that you actually just glanced over previously. They're all baked into copy, they're baking the headings across the site. So um, I think it just comes in with a trained eye, I guess is a different way to look at it. Yeah, I can imagine quite, quite when you look at content, you quite quickly pick up, uh, having done it so long, what's going on. Um, but it's the untrained eye, they look at it and go, oh, I just don't know, I don't know. <laughs> um, so the, the tools then that you mentioned, um, there are various tools out there that I've come across, obviously SEMrush, Hrefs, you know, these are different pieces of software, which I think are industry standard these days. Um, they all want, you know, $50 million a month subscription fee. I'm, I'm jesting, obviously it's not that expensive, but you know, these aren't cheap investments, I don't think. Um, which is why I do think actually, if you're starting out, do look at an agency because the costs of learning and the costs of software, the, cost, the barriers to entry are quite high on quite a few of these things. Um, and that's before you even think about the expertise and getting them right from sort of day one. Um, I liked your analogy on the pension fund of backlinks. <laughs> that, was, that was quite clever. Um, so, but tools wise, what is, I mean, we mentioned chat GPT earlier on. Should I just forget writing content with chat GPT altogether and just, should I use it to outline? Should I, I I'm kind of curious where you sit with the whole AI thing. There's like programs like, I'm just thinking of when we came across SEO Surfer that will go and analyze and write blog posts for you based on information that it's found. I guess where where should I where should I not play is a good question. Yeah, so start by saying I would not suggest writing a full article with ChatGPT. Um, I think it's a great tool. I think it works great for ideas around FAQs. Like if you were to say, here is a topic or my brand or my niche and mega threes, for example, give me a set of customer focused FAQs that might be useful to someone learning about a mega threes. That's mm -hmm. your chat GPT prompt right there. Um, switching gears and kind of looking at things like surfer SEO, 
great tool. We use uh, SEO Wind, which is a very similar aspect of that. Um, mm -hmm. And what it does is it uses AI to analyze the top 10 search results for a given keyword and then scans what headings they're using and then allows you to create an outline based on that. So you have a competitive edge and you can kind of alleviate having 10 million open tabs, trying to sit between <laughs> all of them and read them and memorize them. Yeah, so yeah. anything to kind of save time on that aspect, it's godsend. Um, we use Ahrefs, this kind of as you are mentioning, which is a more data analysis tool to look mm -hmm. at keywords specifically. Um, but with that, you can look at an average estimated monthly search volume for any keyword. You can also look at the competitiveness of that relative to what's ranking. You can take a look at people's backlink profiles. So if you went and looked at a competitor site and saw that they had a bunch of links from someone you never even thought about, maybe it's a different podcast or a publisher, whatever it may be, reach out to them and say, hey, I noticed you have a podcast and I know that you've talked about Omega-3s a lot. I'd love to come on your show and talk about mm -hmm. it as well. So just creating those relationship industries, however you're looking at it, there's a ton of resources out there. But yeah, I mean, we kind of stick to the, the heavy hitting ones. Like you said, they are spendy, but when you take a look at the fact that Ahrefs would be impossible, like not having Ahrefs, it's impossible to have our business. Mm -hmm. Like the ROI on Ahrefs is pretty successful, I guess, in terms of how it's <laughs> leveraged. So um, yeah, I mean, it, it really comes down to what you're in need of at that time. But I think if you're a beginner who's looking to DIY it, you know, SEO wind, surfer SEO, you can get pretty far with those. Mm. Um, but to your point, you know, if you're looking to kind of make SEO a serious investment over a six to 12 month plus timeline, agency is definitely going to be best bang for your buck, especially with Trio SEO, because not only do you not have to learn everything, we have the expertise, we have the infrastructure and system to take it from zero to 10. But at the same time, even if you were to hire an in-house person, it's probably going to be, that's going to be two or three times more expensive than an agency. Yeah. So yeah. You kind of have to weigh out your options and see what's best for you. So uh, I guess then some d deep practical questions, if I can, Stephen. If I'm writing a blog post, how long should it be? I imagine that's quite a yeah, common so we, question. <laughs> it is. Yeah. So we usually aim for 1,500 to 2,000 words with an asterisk on that. And what I mean is that if there's a topic out there that is likely going to exceed that, we're not going to cut out information. So you know, if it's a one-off thing, maybe it's like the ultimate A to Z guide on Omega threes. Mm -hmm. I would hope that there's more than 1500 words of information <laughs> about that. But Depends to play devil's talking. advocate, yeah. <laughs> exactly. You also don't want, nobody wants to read a 6,000 word article. So mm -hmm. there has to be this thing where people say, well, you're writing content for Google at that rate. And you're trying to stuff keywords and do all this sort of mm -hmm. stuff. And on the flip side of that, we say, well, not really because, you know, we understand the logical flow of how someone gets on that page and what information they're looking for. So if it's something about, you know, like a off brand thing, we might add in like a TLDR snippet at the top and try to summarize different sections of it because mm -hmm. we can, we just know how people are going to lose interest over anything over 4,000 words, even that thousand words. So yeah, you have to kind of keep that in mind, but yeah, to play rule of thumb, 1500 is probably a good ballpark. Um, but don't be afraid to go over or under. I've even ranked articles that are 500 words. If it's an FAQ, don't, don't expand on it. Like we always like to say, there's nothing worse than trying to find a recipe and having to read 6,000 words of content about your grandma's historical pastime, making cookies in her kitchen. It's like, nah, just give me the recipe. It's what I came here yeah, for. Yeah, I guess Same that, you are right, content. yeah. <laughs> the one of the most annoying things, isn't it, about recipe sites is you have to scroll right down to the bottom just to actually oh. get to the, the recipe. Um, and you just kind of like, okay, I understand why you've done it. And I, I appreciate, you know, you've got to make a living from this, but blimey, can we think about this differently? Put the recipe at the top and just yeah. put everything else below it. Please. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess about 1500 words, should I, how does, how does this work? Um, I feel like I'm, I'm getting a lot of free counsel here on, on Omega 3s, but let's say I want to throw in some video aspects as well. Does, um, could I take my 1500 words, use that as a video script, create a talking head video for YouTube, throw in some nice B-roll or whatever, um, add that to the article. Does that help? 
Yeah, definitely. So that's kind of where we look at like what's called off page SEO. Mm -hmm. um, and so off page is like anything that is outside of your website, but has the intent to point back to your website. So if you posted that content on YouTube and then you embedded that YouTube video in that article, and that would be like a supplementary resource for that reader, yeah. that's going to be a great engagement tool, not only for the reader, but it shows Google that, Hey, your competitors don't have a video on this. Like maybe that has value to offer people. So however you can kind of bake in more value overall is going to be a win at the end of the day. Yeah, no, fantastic. Fantastic. So internal linking, just explain what you mean by that and why that's so important. Yeah. So internal linking, a great way to kind of visualize that is if you picture a spider web and the center of the spider web that kind of holds everything together is going to be your core homepage or kind of like the main page of your content or your site. And then if you kind of picture like each ring of that spider web as it expands out is going to be a content hub or what we call a content cluster. So maybe if it's Omega threes, maybe it's about, um, I'm just making stuff up like the history of Omega threes. And then you can go into all the articles of, you know, where they were discovered, why are they important? How long have they been used? And those are going to be like little string subjects off that. And then maybe mm -hmm. it goes into production. How are they made? Where are they made? How often are they produced? How often should you take them? And it goes into like all of these different little subcategories. Yeah. And then once those pieces of content are produced, you start to find keywords within the body of the content that relates to a second article. So you'd link that article from A to B. And what that helps Google do is crawl your website more efficiently. So if you have an ultimate guide yeah. and you're like, enjoying this guide, learn more about the history of Omega threes, history of Omega threes, quote unquote, would then be linked to a guide about the history of Omega threes. And it just kind of helps Google crawl and understand your website better as it does readers. And is there, I, I, I guess I, I as I'm listening to you talk, I'm, I'm thinking of a particular website um, that I know about where there is no real internal linking, but there's 400 blog posts on it. And I'm thinking, how in the world <laughs> was someone, someone's got to read 400 blog posts to figure out what's being said where, and then have that understanding of the content to then create those internal links based on what's going on. Is it as old school as that, or is there something out there that can help me create these internal links? Please, God, let there be something. That will help me. <laughs> yeah, so there are definitely tools out there um, when it comes into, like, I think, I think Surfer has a tool built in that kind of offers that. Um, I'm old school, so I have always steered away from tools like that because mm -hmm. what I've learned over time is that they're good, but they're not perfect. And so right. it might, you know, it, it, it might offer something that's not the greatest link opportunity or at the end of the day they just show you all of them and maybe yeah. someone actually goes yeah click add all and maybe that's like 15 links when really you should only aim for like three to five internal mm. links so some cases they're just not the most optimized they're getting better um but what we do at trio is we'll, we'll start with all of the content on the site throw that into what we call like an internal linking library so that all of the writers moving forward then have access to those links and can just crawl that spreadsheet and say, mm. perfect, there's a link on this or an article about this. I'm just going to bake that into my content so that when we go and upload it, it's already there. Um, but to your example, if you have a ton of content on your site that hasn't been internally linked, it's definitely going to be a one-time push to get that done. It's probably going to suck. <laughs> no, there's just no, <laughs> no way around it. But, um, but at the end of the day, like internal linking is probably one of the more underappreciated and overlooked strategies that can move the needle for a site. So mm. if that person had zero internal links across 400 articles and you look back two months later and they're all perfectly internal linked, that site's definitely going to benefit from it. It's going to be a big, big win. So, yeah. um, but yeah, it's always better to do it in the process while you're doing anything rather mm. than going back and doing it later. It's just, I used to do that and I learned once you got to touch the stove to know it's hot. It's <laughs> It used to be that um, I, I, what what you see now is you'll see in, a, in, a, in an article an internal link on a specific phrase, which I'm assuming is is deliberate in the sense that that phrase will be a keyword at some point that will rank on Google. It used to be 
a, that you would just put tags at the bottom, almost like hashtags on an Instagram post. You know what I mean? At the bottom, we're going to put a little tag cloud in and this is about omega-3s, this one over here is about vitamin D, and we'll just we'll tag all these different things uh, at the bottom of it. Do we, still, do we still do the tags or are we actually put in the internal links on the text? Sorry to get granular, but I was just kind of curious. Yeah, so the internal linking with the text is kind of like a non-negotiable, and what you described is like that keyword being optimized is like you get the nail on the head there. So what I usually say is the anchor text or that keyword that you're linking should um, a describe what the other piece of content is about so you can be able to look at that and know exactly what's on the other end mm -hmm. and it should also match or be close to the primary keyword that you want that piece of content on the other side to rank for so if it's history of omega-3s and that's the keyword you're trying to go for with that second guide that should be what is linked yeah. um, but you want to be able to use some variants you don't want to repeat it over and over again um, to your second question about the tags, it's pretty dated, I would say, like very, you know, probably a few people are using those cluster mm. clouds like we used to see on the widgets of the sidebar yeah, and all yeah, sort yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Um, but categories are still a great, very effective way to organize your blog. And we always mm. encourage them to because, you know, just like, you know, you, people usually see the blog on the footer. Well, if you have seven or five other categories that are worth reading, you know, put those on your footer, put them somewhere else, and people can just quickly access them. And so uh, there's a lot of like tips and tricks you can do to increase the efficiency of your SEO. And mm -hmm. so categories is definitely a great way to do that. If I was, um, if I was thinking then of doing a blog and I have a site, say, uh, on a standard e-com platform, I'm going to pick, I'm going to pick on Shopify because it's the one that people know sure. about. Um, I, I personally can't tell you if Shopify has an inbuilt blogging platform. I know it didn't have necessarily, and there were some apps that would, would were sort of able to help you do that. I don't know whether that's still the case. But do I, what software out there, if I've got to say a Shopify site, should I go and say, right, well, this is a great blogging platform that I can use for my e-commerce website. And I'm going to put all my blogs on this and it will probably be a, I don't know, blog.shop.com uh, domain name or something like that. Um, do, what would you recommend? Yeah, so Shopify, they have a built-in blog component. It works really well. I've seen tons of sites crush SEO from their blog through mm -hmm. Shopify. Um, the way it's set up is it's not even on a subdomain, which is you don't have to do like a blog.brand.com. They mm -hmm. just have it as an extension as a secondary folder. So it'd be dot com forward slash black blog excuse me and then whatever that slug is going to be yeah um so i mean yeah it, it's pretty streamlined nowadays and very efficient if you're using shopify um even if you're like using Word, wordpress and woocommerce you know wordpress is a great blogging platform yeah squarespace i mean they're all it's yeah it's 2024 everyone has that capability everyone's, I wouldn't everyone's doing it, it right yeah so you don't yeah. need a separate blog these days and I wouldn't even recommend that even if it wasn't an option because you're pretty much then essentially having to build two sites. So right. you want all of that domain authority and your brand credibility in one place. I kind of think going back to that iceberg mentality, you want the deepest, biggest iceberg in the water. You don't want two smaller ones. It's just, you don't want to build two brands. You don't want to have two different things going. Hyper-focus everything at once, put it there. Yeah, that's really interesting. Really, really interesting. So the um, what about companies that have multi-site, as in, um, or for example, our business, we have uh, our main website, but then we have a US version of the site. There's like an Australian version, a Canadian version. I think there's an Irish version. There may be a, a Spanish version um, of the website, all with their own domains in some respects. So, um, well, actually, no, it's all, I'm, as I'm saying this out loud, I'm answering my own question because it's all on the same domain. It's just got the the language tag after it to sort of give you the different languages. Um, should I be blogging, therefore, in different languages as well as doing multi-currencies? Should I, if, I'm do, if I've got these sort of multi-sites, you know, like Apple has Apple UK, Apple US. Um, should I be thinking about that on the blog as well? Uh, I would think about it if your customers are there. So, I mean, like if you have a, um, 
UK audience, like obviously you don't have to write in, you know, the UK because it's like English is English at the end of the day. But if you have a um, German speaking audience, like maybe it makes sense to, you know, transcribe some content over to um, German and put it on a DE, you know, extension. Mm -hmm. um, definitely want to ensure that you have like your um, href, like h reference language tags which is a little more technical seo component which i don't even want to get into because i don't know technical technical <laughs> stuff um Just don't, don't care for it but um <laughs> yeah i mean to, to your question i mean like if, if people are there looking for it um you can't expect everyone to only find it through us mm -hmm. or english speaking pieces of content um however what i would say then too is that you also can't assume that the same strategy is going to be a one-to-one -one fit with that. Right. Because back in the day, um, many moons ago, we dabbled in doing affiliate sites in different languages. And just based on like the translation, the translations are never one-to-one. -one. So how people search for content, like instead of it being best mountain bikes in the US, it might be best outdoor mechanical bikes you know there's just so many different ways and how cultural yeah. differences are um but yeah to your question like i would definitely suggest it's more about if your customers are in need of that content you always have Definitely. to think customer first yeah yeah no fair enough fair enough so all the principles then that you've just gone and outlined um that we've talked through um is it the same principles for on-page seo for say my product page or should I be some thinking about something a little bit different there? Yeah, so with product pages, they're a little bit more unique in that you don't really want to steer too far outside of what that product is. So, you know, if you're obviously talking about Omega 3s and that it's a supplement product page, it probably doesn't make sense to include what are Omega 3s as an mm -hmm. FAQ because one, the reader knows that. Mm -hmm. Two, you don't want to repeat it across any other pages. And three, it's just like, does it actually add value to the page? Mm -hmm. No. So, you know, when it comes to product pages, we usually re recommend like FAQs are great. Um, maybe those are company wide term policies, size, packaging, all this sort of stuff there. Um, and then just anything that kind of adds to your brand or that product. So, um, you know, shipping delays or how is it used? Are there mm -hmm. any things that you need to be unique clothing wise? How is it washed sizes? Um, really should just be hyper-focused on that product specifically. And then you can always use internal links to drive the conversation outward and expand on a specific topic if you wanted to go that route. So use internal links on the product page if you feel like it's necessary. Yeah. And I mean, even if it's not the product page specifically, they should be absolutely mentioned in the footer of your blog. So maybe, maybe you're housing three ultimate guides in your footer where people just automatically scroll down and see, you know, ultimate guide to omega threes, benefits of owning these and, you know, what have recent customers said? Like maybe mm -hmm. it's like your heavy hitting pieces of content that are just permanently living in your footer and then they're currently there, but maybe there's a specific topic you want to highlight in that product page. And if so, that's a great way to internally link to that content. Yeah. How important is it? Um, I guess I'm, it's just, I'm, I'm listening to the question in my head and it's a bit of a strange question, but let's talk <laughs> about, let's talk about the importance of strategy here, because the reason I, I I'm, I'm, I'm asking this, Stephen is to quote a very good friend of mine who lives in North Carolina um, it sounds like you could get busier than a one-legged man in a butt kicking contest. You know, it's that kind of, um, it's one of my favorite phrases. I don't know why. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where, um, it sounds like there's a lot to do. And I'm just thinking of, you know, if I've, if I'm starting my e-commerce business or it's still like a side hustle or, you know, there's just two or three of us in the business, we're turning over a couple of hundred grand. We've not, We've not reached the dizzy heights of a million a year yet, Stephen. I've not got the staff, nor really the money to go and spend on agency. Um, how important is strategy here? And, and I guess, how do we start to form the strategy so we don't become busy fools? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you're doing like a DIY approach to your SEO and you're still like in that hyper lean stage of everything, um, you know, like I said, I, I kind of focus on 
how can you ensure that the customer has all the information needed to convert and move, pull the trigger on that? So what FAQs are they being asked a lot? How are the return policies? How are, you know, what's the shipping like? What's the packaging and handling like? All of those like easy wins, low hanging fruit, that should be done deal. Mm -hmm. um, if there's something that seems like it's a little bit more in depth, create a blog around it and just know that you're creating that content for customers, not for the ranking purposes that you would hope to get organic traffic from. Yeah. And then outside of that, look at the bottom funnel and really kind of put yourself into the customer's mindset and take a look at the keywords. You can also use like, there's a lot of free tools out there that'll kind of get you started and, you know, at least show you what keywords are available. And then what we do is we just kind of like, you know, put on that customer hat and say, how are they thinking about this keyword and what is their actual end result when they're typing this in? Even take it one step further, go and type it in and Google yourself, see what's coming up, see what people are actually writing content around and then see how you can match that and exceed that content and put it on your site. So like SEO is everything is, everything's going to be customer focused. So I feel like a, you know, broken record player to some degree, but like, it's so true. You know, if you're creating content for yourself and because you think it's going to be this great piece of content, it's, you're not the decider at the end of the yeah, day, yeah, yeah. someone yeah. else is. So, yeah. um, yeah, really just kind of like ask your customers, don't be afraid to just say, Hey, what are these topics are of interest to you? You don't actually have to produce them, but you know, start talking to people, getting that, you know, foot in the door and just seeing where that conversation lies. Um, cause I mean, they're, they're decision makers at the end of the day for your brand. So mm -hmm. everything should be focused around them. That's super, super important. I, I, I've often told the story that, um, one of the, th one of the things that I, I look back at, you know, my sort of e-com career, been around a little while. We had this one website, which was a beauty website. It was doing super well. And um, I came to a point where I looked at the site and I realized I personally was the guy that had designed the layout for every single iteration of that website up until this point. And this was maybe, when would this have been? Maybe seven or eight years ago, maybe even nine, ten. it was a while ago. Um, and and I re we'd gone like through four different designs and I'd played around in Photoshop and gone, oh, I think we could do this, that and the other. And then we brought a branding guy in and he was like, oh, you could redo your brand. And we redid the brand and it was all wonderful. And then I realized, well, the guy redid the brand. He's cool. I've laid out the website based on what I know about e-commerce. I'm OK. I, I, I kind of got some insight into that. And then I realized that actually our customers were 95 percent female. And I'm like, you've got a guy doing branding and you've got a guy designing the website. As much knowledge as we have, I don't know if that's the right thing to do. So I called a friend of mine, a guy called Rich Wise and lives in Dallas. And um, I said, Rich, have you still got, he had quite a few uh, female designers working for him. And I said, have you still got that team, you know, of, of female designers, web designers? And he's like, yeah. I said, I need them to redesign my website and redo the branding. It's like, well, we, we don't really have any experience in e-commerce. I'm like, I've got that. What I don't have is the female psyche, the female knowledge. So I'm like, can you please just create something and we'll make it work around e-commerce? And he's like, sure, man. So we, we did this project together and it was utterly eye-opening because what they came up with, they were thinking about it through the lens of them as a customer. They were buying the kind of products that we were selling. And it's like, oh, we'd love this on the site. We'd love that. And it was so far removed from what I did, but the conversion rate went boom, vertical. Do you know what I mean? It, it had a big impact on our business. And I think I, I'm thinking about some of the other websites, you know, some of our other e-com sites. One of the things that we have subconsciously done um, as a, since that time is, for example, we have a, on the supplement side, it's predominantly female again it's not all it's 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 not as as heavy as it was on the beauty website so the predominant people that write copy are females i don't know if that's important um steve maybe you can comment on this that uh, maybe i've got it wrong a little bit here because if it's predominantly female i have female copywriters write the copy who are similar to the target audience if that makes sense so i don't have 20 year olds write to 40 year olds and and and, and so on and so forth is that what you guys do? Am I, am I reading too much into this? No, I think you're on a similar trajectory. Um, I would say that less important on maybe gender, and I would say more important on the um, technical expertise of the person writing the content. 
Um, for example, you know, some things that come to mind is like legal guides, like mm. what is a, um, you know, what is a letter of intent, you know, something like that, where you probably don't want a generalist writer tackling that subject. You yeah. probably want someone who's a legal background or even like, you know, if you start dabbling in finance topics, which are always super sensitive, like, you know, what is a Roth IRA or what is a versus anything? It's like those have to be very specific. Um, and Google also takes that into consideration. You know, there are certain niches with that fall within the your money, your life kind of category of health and finance that they need that credible writer to succeed yeah. and for that content to flourish. So I definitely think that when it comes down to it, someone who's expecting a technical piece of content should be met with a semi-technical piece of content. Obviously you want to simplify it, but it shouldn't be as easy as how to boil water. It should, you know, <laughs> have some depth to it. Yeah. Yeah. Fair play. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Listen, Stephen, I'm aware of time. I'm aware I've got 20 more questions, but I'm aware of time and I don't <laughs> want to take up too much time from you, Dave. Is there anything else? I mean, we've had a great conversation, but is there anything else from you that you, you want to mention before we sign off? No, I think I think we've covered a lot. I mean, I just want to remind people that, you know, blogging is the iceberg of your brand that you're going to look back on 12, 16, 24 months later and wish you would have started then. So, um, <laughs> you know, we're always helpful and happy to help people get on the right track when it comes to their content and driving, you know, qualified people and the right customers to their blog and brand. So, um, yeah, trueseo.com and uh, learn more about us there. Yeah. And if they want to reach out to you personally, what's the best way to do that? Just head to the website or are you on LinkedIn? Are you, do you do that kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty popular on LinkedIn. I wish I'm just joking. Um. <laughs> there's a queue. You can find me on LinkedIn, yeah. but there's a queue. You just have to wait a little bit. Yeah. Get in line. No, no. Um, yeah. We're all on LinkedIn, me and Connor Gillivan, Nathan Hirsch, all of the trio founders. Um, that's the best way to get like a one-on-one -on -one with me and kind of like mm. talk. I'm always loving to meet people and have coffee calls. Um, but yeah, that's great. I mean, you can always reach out to the website. I'm sure it'll find me somehow, but LinkedIn's definitely going to be the best, more direct way. Fantastic. We will, of course, link to Stephen uh, in the show notes as well. And so, yeah, you can, if you've not got those um, and you're not subscribed to the email, you're not going to get them in your inbox, are you? But, you know, if you were, they're going to come to you. Uh, but listen, Stephen, uh, thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Great to meet you. Um, I've course. enjoyed the conversation about SEO. I'm, I've got some questions for the team. There's a few companies I'm going to send your way because I think they're going to need a little bit of help. But um, genuinely really appreciate having you on the show. Thanks for coming and uh, sharing all your wisdom. Thank you. Cheers. It's been great. Cheers. Love that. Cheers. Uh, <laughs> what a great conversation <laughs> with Stephen. In fact, I can do this, Stephen. I can do the, uh, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Again, I need, I need the sound bite for my life. I mean, this is just, it's been. <laughs> Oh, awesome. Awesome. Well, brilliant. Thank you. And so let me just say, uh, be sure to follow the e-commerce podcast wherever you get your podcasts from, uh, because we've got more great conversations lined up and I don't want you to miss any of them. And in case no one has told you yet today, let me be the first. You are awesome. Yes, you are. Created awesome. It's just a burden you have to bear. Stephen has to bear it. I've got to bear it. You've got to bear it as well. Now, the e-commerce podcast is produced by Pod Junction. You can find our entire archive of episodes on your favorite podcast app. The team that makes this show possible is Sadaf Bainon and Tanya Hutzlack. Our theme music was written by Josh Edmondson. And as I mentioned, if you would like to read the transcript or show notes, just simply head over to the website ecommercepodcast.com. Net, uh, where incidentally you can sign up to the newsletter if you're not signed up to it, but do that. So that's it from me. That's it from Stephen. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a fantastic week wherever you are in the world. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.